Hello and welcome to our chemistry project. In this video we will explore Joseph Priestley's discovery of oxygen. We will tell you about the chemistry when he lived and how he changed it all. We will explore him, his life, his ideas and his discovery. We will reveal his lead up and his previous inventions including the carbonated drink. We will do our own demonstration of what he discovered and how he realised its significance. Substitute some of the materials before discussing how and why it was such an important breakthrough and how he changed the world he lived in and how finally it has set a new basis for chemistry. Thank you for watching and enjoy. In the Middle Ages, they had just started to work out the key building blocks of the world, but were having trouble pinning down how to process them, such as combustion and respiration, and they wanted to see how they worked, and why they only worked in some places with some materials. The most common theory was that there were four elements, fire, air, earth and water. All liquids made of water, solids were made of earth, and all gases were made of air. Fire was an element that governed heat and combustion. However, there were clearly many flaws with this theory. Fire is not an element. Air is a mixture. Water is a compound. And earth is another mixture. Johann Joachim Becker was a German scientist who in 1667 first proposed a theory to solve this problem. He postulated the existence of a fire-like element called Fleutigsten, which was contained within combustible bodies and released during combustion. Phlogisticated substances are those that contain Fleutigsten and are deflogisticated when burned. In general, substances that burned in air were said to be rich in Fleutigsten. The fact that combustion soon stopped in enclosed space was taken as clear evidence that air had the capacity to absorb only finite amounts of phlogiston. When air had become completely phlogisticated, it would no longer serve to support combustion of any material, nor would it support life. Because the role of respiration was to remove phlogiston from the body, Becker had originally named this substance terra but in 1703, George Ernest Stahl German professor of medicine and chemistry proposed a variant of the theory in which he renamed Becker's terrapin guise to Floydgen, and it was in this form that this incorrect theory had its greatest influence. In 1733, a young man called Joseph Priestley was born. He was the eldest child of six, born to a poor family near Leeds. When he was very young, he was sent to live with his charger's aunt, Sarah. This was important as their beliefs were not that of the church because he was not well associated with the church. Many non-Christian people met there and had theological and political discussions. It was here that he was introduced to science. He went to a well-established grammar school at the age of 12 and learned mathematics and science as well as many languages. He grew up to become a prosperous chemist. In 1765, he wrote two academic books and received an honour from Edinburgh University for his contributions at Warrington. The next year, while on a trip, he met Benjamin Franklin, one of the most important scientists in his day. He was the man who got Priestley interested in chemistry. After that, he started reading books on electricity and conducting related experiments. Because of these experiments, he was selected to become a member of the Royal Society. His first major breakthrough was that he discovered that graphite conducted electricity. This was a great achievement because he was not very trained in scientific research. Priestley lived next to a brewery and in 1770, became interested in air that floated over fermenting grains. He did not know that because of his study of gases, he had become one of the greatest chemists of all time. Priestley published his experiments a lot 
by investigating this gas, he was discovering carbon dioxide, which he named fixed air. This was air that we breathe out, and he showed that it could also put out flames. He realised this when he mixed it with, with water. It had a pleasant and tangy taste. He had invented carbonated water, or soda pop. He sold this water to the public. For this discovery, he was awarded a medal from, by the Royal Society in 1773. In the same year, he made another important discovery. He placed a shoot of a green plant in a container of water. Then he covered the container and lit a candle until it completely burned out. Earlier, many had found when a light candle is extinguished in air, the same air cannot support a flame anymore. The air was phlogisticated, but Priestley was able to burn the candle again and keep a mouse alive in the air in the presence of a green plant. He became the first ever to observe the respiration of plants, the fact that they take in carbon dioxide and push oxygen. Priestley devised the new apparatus, the punomic trough, that allowed him to collect gases over mercury. No gases are soluble in mercury, so it had major advantages over water. However, it was 13.6 times heavier than water, and so it was difficult to pass a small amount of gas through it. He solved this problem in an innovative way. Instead of passing the gas through the mercury, he generated it over the mercury. He floated various materials over mercury, that would decompose and generate a gas upon being heated and seal a glass vessel over the top. He heated them with a magnifying glass by focusing the sun's rays on them. The whole setup was a masterpiece of genius. Had he not done this over mercury, he could not have discovered ammonia and hydrochloric acid because these gases are highly soluble in water. In 1774, Priestley put a piece piece of mercuric oxide in the test chamber and isolated a new gas. He noted that a glowing spin relights when inserted into this gas. He then placed a mouse into the jar, expecting it to die soon. Unexpectedly, it prospered and appeared exceptionally healthy. He then tried breathing the gas himself and noted that it felt light and easy to breathe. He even thought it become a luxury form of air, available for the rich to breathe only. Little did he know, he had discovered oxygen. Now we're going to give you a live demonstration of Joseph Priestley's famous experiment. Instead of using mercuric oxide, we will use potassium chlorate, with the catalyst of manganese dioxide. And rather than floating it on mercury, we'll heat it separately and let the produced oxygen rise through the water into a gas jar. First of all, we will turn the Bunsen burner to a roaring blue flame. This will gradually heat the potassium chlorate until it decomposes into potassium chloride and oxygen. The oxygen will then travel through the tubes and into the water bowl, where it will rise filling the gas jar. Because the water is being pushed down, the water level will rise in the bowl. As you can see, the bottom is starting to melt. And there's bubbles coming up. Yeah, look, just, so we have here, we have this just starting to bubble. And you can see it's going down, out through there. Oxygen is what we breathe in and is required by all animals. Respiration is transforming oxygen and glucose into carbon dioxide, water and energy. Oxygen is required in combustion. When you remove oxygen from a fire by smothering it, it goes out. The more there is, the stronger and more uncontrollable the fire, and so oxygen can be regarded as extremely flammable.
When you blow out a splint, the air remains glowing, but if you insert this glowing very hot splint into pure oxygen, it instantaneously relights. Here we show you a short contest between us to see who can relight the splint the most times in a jar of oxygen. Two, three. Oh no! One. Yeah, that's it again. I bet you all the options. Four. This isn't fair. Five. Six. Put it out. Yeah. Don't put it on the heat with You're mat. not even putting it out. Yeah. This is awful. <laughs> this is it's not my fault. It's not out, Matt. <laughs> it was. Out. There we go. There don't go don't right hit in. it on the table. Just pull. No. No, no, no it wasn't. No. I've got a massive split. The machine. Six, seven. Oh. Oh, we still doing That's it. Fine. Twelve. Yeah, I'm just doing it. Thirteen. Fourteen. Uh, Fourteen. Fourteen. By indirectly disproving Floydstrom, Joseph Priestley freed chemistry from its clutches. Before his discovery, all scientific discovery in this field was related to the Floydstrom theory, and in this way, research could not progress in the mat most matters of chemistry. With this discovery, the frozen world of chemistry was set into motion again. However, it was not Priestley himself who actually disproved Floydstrom. He made the discovery that could have disproved it, but like many other scientists in the day, fell into the trap of Floydstrom, reverently kept within with the incorrect theory until he died. Priestley met with French scientist Antonio Lavoisier, born in 1743. They met in 1774, and he told him all about his experiment with mercuric oxide. Lavoisier, intrigued, went back and conducted the exact same experiment in reverse. Lavoisier carefully weighed some mercury before strongly heating it until it had turned into mercuric oxide. He then weighed it again and found the mass had increased by a substantial amount, had taken something in. He heated it again until it decomposed into mercury and found that the mass had gone down to the exact, exact original amount. This, this substance, oxygen, was being taken into mer mercuric oxide and released from it to turn into mercury. He thus disproved the substance known as phlogiston, and therefore it was he, and not Priestley, who went down as his in history as a father of modern chemistry. Priestley refused to acknowledge Lavoisier's discovery and died naturally on the 6th of February 1804. We have now talked about Priestley, his discovery and his legacy. We know that although Priestley set the basis for the demise of Floydstrom, it was Antonio Lavoisier that famously disproved the hugely popular explanation. Without Priestley, however, none of that would have been possible. And we should thank him for this. How far we have got with chemistry to the day. As well as the fizzy drink and the pencil rubber. And so we bring this project to an end, reflecting on Priestley and Lavoisier's marvellous conquer of Floydstone. Thank you for watching.